Bonjour, bonsoir, dear friends. Welcome to JCB Live. This is a happy hour with a very charismatic lady. Powerful, wine writer, TV personality. She's been on every channel in the United States. You will recognize her because she's very charming. She is one of the very few first master of wine in the United States. As a matter of fact, the seventh woman awarded this amazing title. She does some of the best wine lists in the country. She was born in the middle of the US, moved to Brooklyn. She writes about wine, speaks about wine, consults about wine. There's no secret about her wine knowledge. She's very well known in the world of masters of wine and some of the best of the best. Her name is Christy Canterbury. Dear friends, I'm delighted to introduce the writer, the judge, the buyer, the speaker on wine, Christy, welcome and good to see you. Woohoo! Bonsoir, Santé. Bonsoir, Christy, <laughs> comment ça va? Excellent, merci. Et toi? Well, you are dazzling. You're looking so beautiful on the screen. So, is this your beautiful home? Yes, this is home. This is not where I would usually be joining you from because I have just come back um, from Texas. So I am required by New York to quarantine. So I'm quarantining in my bedroom suite, not in my, well, <laughs> not in my office, in but bedroom. I am at home in Brooklyn. You know, it's very dangerous to be with a Frenchman in your bedroom. You know that. <laughs> oh la la. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh la la. And I know you have experience with Frenchmen because I must say, dear friends, for all of you watching, Christy is perfectly fluent in French. How did you become so fluent? I was extremely lucky to have a French teacher in high school. I, I grew up in Texas and everyone took Spanish. So I always like to do something different. And I decided to take French. That was the only other option in my small high school. And my teacher was from France, from Bordeaux. Wow. Um, and she had married um, a, a serviceman from World War II and had come back to my hometown. So I was very lucky to have not only a good French teacher, but a French French teacher um, who inspired my passion for um, everything that is La France and uh, the culture, the food, and eventually the wine. And then I went on um, to take French um, in uh, university as well, and then to live in, in France. So um, step by step, that's how I, I got to speak well, in French. And you know, you recognize a very good French accent, Christy, as you know, when you know how to say the ah, France, you said. So dear friends, if you want to be impressing the French, you say France like Christy. Say it again for us. La France. As in, Ooh, vive la France. Oh, it makes me <laughs> shiver. It gets me excited. <laughs> well, <laughs> cheers, Christy. And I'm cheers. so pleased to see you because you remember the last time we saw each other in New York together? I do. It was in 2017. And I was amazed to see you because I knew you were going to be there, except that you could have decided not to come. Um, you showed up um, to pour some wines for clients right after i believe the day before even you were fighting off the napa uh forest fires the wildfires with the garden hose That's at your right. winery <laughs> you and i was amazed memory. that you flew across the country to be with us i just well, you know when incredible. you have a commitment with christy canterbury you come and I'd, it was only six hours away and it was a great escape then if you do recall that same night i came back to california and we eventually won over those fires. So it was a good, it was a good thing to cross the country for the good reasons to see you and to do such great things. Well, we, I, we were honored and I was truly amazed and um, your, your strength and fortitude um, to hold to your word and to, to do everything for everyone at such a stressful time um, will stay for a very long time in my memory. Well, thank you. So Christy, you were born and raised in this beautiful part of Northeast Texas which I love because I'm a big fan, huge fan of the Texas people. You studied there and now you live in Brooklyn, which is kind of the capital of great food, great artisan in New York. You lived in France. So how do you get so passionate about food and wine and who you are today? Well, um, the, the food definitely came from my mom. She was a great cook. 
um, cooks very differently than I do, but uh, was a, a fantastic cook um, and there were always great meals on the table. So um, it started there. And then as I moved to New York, um, started you know going out to great restaurants in New York, moved to Paris, saw all the great restaurants in Paris. Um, it just that, that interest in food um, developed very quickly. And my interest in wine started when I was doing that classic thing that um, so many university students do. I studied um, in France for a summer. I was in um, the south of France. I was in uh, Boulouris, which is a small oh. town just to the uh, just to the west of um, of uh, Cannes and to the east of Saint Tropez. And in the night, back very trendy, Europe. fashionable area of France. Ooh la la! It was. It was. Um, you know, as a university student, it's kind of harder to participate. You know, you're not exactly on the yachts, but you're still at, you're, you're still in the moment. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and then traveled around Europe and just you know, going around and you know drinking, um, you know, you know lots of vin de soif in the cafes and you know traveling around Italy and drinking the you know the their table wine uh, vino de tavola and that sort of thing really got me into it and I saw all of these different wines and there's such a massive diversity um, yeah. that inspired me and eventually as I continued tasting wine as a consumer and an, an enthusiast, I decided to move from my initial career in finance, um, which lasted five years, <laughs> into, well, into wine. People. Because I and, love, and I was amazed when we first met, you mentioned, oh, you were very serious in finance and obviously very successful there in New York. And suddenly you decide to make the change. And I know many of our friends, and probably they will activate the chat on that, is how do you make a life transition as such to follow your passion? Uh, yes, not easy, especially I was living in Soho and Manhattan at the time and wanted to stay there and wanted to be able to enjoy New York, an expensive city, while kind of blundering out into the world of wine. I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, so I started by using my uh, finance background to get into kind of a businessy jobs, if you will. Mm -hmm. And um, and and that worked, and, and many of the uh, jobs that I had subsequently were very much focused on having this financial background and numbers acumen, while being in uh, the wine world. And so, in order to give myself, while well, I did this, some some uh, some street cred, if you will, I started taking uh, the WSET. I took what was then the intermediate course, so the second. So course. you you went right away, just for everybody to to know, because there's a lot of friends not in the wine world who are dying to get into it, you went into knowledge and education. That was your entry. You said, I'm great in finance, I love wine, but I want an education in it and to be very good at it, correct? Yes, absolutely. And um, once I finished the, um, the, the diploma course for the WSET or the Wine and Spirits Education Trust, um, I, I wondered for a little bit, you know, this is crazy. Am I going to do this master of wine thing? I mean, honestly, it sounds horrible. <laughs> it sounds crazy. Torturous. Um, and, and it was, but totally worth it. I would do it again uh, if I had to. And uh, after talking to a couple of people um, and, and realizing that I wouldn't be the only one in New York, that I could have some study buddies and, and some people to co go through the process with, um, yeah. I took the plunge. Wow, this is amazing because, well, you've all, have you always been such an overachiever? Well, I guess it's always um, relative what is overachieving, but I've always been very goal oriented. Yeah, this is impressive because dear friends, the master of wine is the highest achievement you can ever get in the wine world. And if I would go for it, I would fail, fail, fail. F minus, we know it doesn't exist, but they will invent the great for me. And you passed <laughs> and you did it in such a short period of time. So why did you shoot so high? I mean, you come from finance, you start with a, you know, the WSTT exam and you then master of one. I mean, it's, it's literally the PhD from Harvard. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a book that I read several years ago and it's called Mountains of the Mind. And, um, uh -huh. And it talks about mountain climbers, and I'm not a mountain climber. I love hiking in the mountains or trekking, but I, not, I'm not climbing those um, crazy peaks. But it's a you know why do why do people go to climb Everest or wh whatever of the great peaks of the world because yeah. it's there, and that's really why I decided to embark on the Master of Wine program. So well said. Why do they do this because it's there, and why not going for it? This is well said. <laughs> well, talking about 
great words. Why don't you tell us a little bit about our JCB 69 here, which is, as you know, my passionate and one of my favorite wine on every show. I serve it and I pop the cork because I've never gotten bored ever with this wine. In the bathtub, under the shower, in the pool, on a tete a tete, in your fancy restaurant. I love it. So tell us about it. Well, first of all, I have to say that I know that you actually filled a bathtub with this wine at one point. And I have to say, I, I would love to understand the texture of what that feels like. So that's that's in my mind for some time down the road. You know, I'm going to send <laughs> but, you a case after today. I know Jen is very diligent. We're going to send you a full case and you'll send us a picture of you. 50% water, 50% bubble, and make sure we see it. I, I'm in. <laughs> I'll do it. This is I'm only fascinated. Because one of the things I love about wine so much and what you get in bubbles is texture. Yes. Uh, because here you know, we're talking about the master wine and you, we do all this blind tasting of all these wines. And I used to think it was really this parlor trick where you smell a, a wine and then bingo, you know what it is. And I thought, wow, I'm not good at this because I can't do that. And I, then I realized that so much of my blind tasting comes from texturing what's, you know, what's happening on the palate and not just the aromas, of course the aromas count, but, and, and count for a lot, but it's texture. So um, I love texture and I certainly love the texture um, that I'm getting here because the bubbles are this, yes. they're this suave, creamy, layered, just kind of like enveloping um, the tongue and just kind of dancing in every single crevice in my mouth, which I love. And the other thing that is really remarkable about this Clément de Bourgogne is that it's all Pinot Noir. It's so unusual to see 100% yes. Pinot Noir for a bubbly. Uh, I, I love that. Um, and it's um, it's such a, a pretty, pretty pale pink and it's quite delicate. I, you know, it, it can, Pinot can be quite forceful, and that there's this just elegance, gentleness. It's très bourguignon. Oh, 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 so I'm getting you some roses. <laughs> oh, the rose of the Pinot. <laughs> so, Christy, besides obviously doing what you've done as, as this great achievement, and I recommend everyone obviously to check this out because this is literally the PhD from Harvard or MIT or whatever great school you aspire to go. You then participated into opening some very cool restaurants. So I'd love for you to share with our friends, we've never really talked about it live on, on our JCB program about how does it feel? One, to open a restaurant. Two, for the famous organization Smith and Wolonski that we all know is very iconic. So tell us. Uh, well, I, I, I will tell you flat out, even though I love what I do today working for myself, my favorite job ever was working with Alan and Michael Stillman at Smith & Wolinsky. Um, really? really, truly visionaries, um, complicated, difficult people, but in the right way because they yeah. wanted to make everything amazing. Um, they did a phenomenal job of taking care of their people. Um, and that was a great testimony that you would have servers who'd worked for them for 40 plus years. It was just a phenomenal organization. And um, I opened two restaurants with Smith & Wolinsky, which actually were um, recreations of restaurants. And the first one um, was Park Avenue Cafe and Park Avenue in the 60s in Manhattan. And we recreated that from Park Avenue Cafe to Park Avenue, uh, summer, fall, winter, spring. So every, um, every three months, you're getting a new decor, a new menu, a new wine list, or at least partially a new wine list. It was absolute nuts. They would close down the restaurant for 24 or 48 hours, change everything out and make something new. And that was uh, that was also my first restaurant opening and it was a lot of fun and very demanding. I and then the second, imagine. Yeah, I the, second. Sec the second was with, um, um, also with the Stillman Group, um, which is now called Fourth Wall Restaurant Group. And uh, that was, um, it was called uh, the Manhattan Ocean Club. And we changed oh. that into Quality Meats, um, which was um, a load of fun. Um, and, you know, just a, um, a big, gorgeous restaurant. Um, both times we had fantastic, um, you know, uh, interior designers, um, a wonderful chefs. And um, we all just had a very good time trying to bring wonderful hospitality um, to, you um, you know, some pretty discerning palettes in Manhattan. And what is wonderful hospitality? Describe it to, to us. What is it to you? 
Uh, I think that it's thinking everything out. It's kind of like that, um, you know, the great, since we just had the Super Bowl, great football players or basketball or whatever, they, they kind of visualize everything before it happens in order to make sure that it, you know, they're, they're in, they're really in the moment. They've thought about it so they can deliver it exactly as they're supposed to. And um, they've run the plays in their mind to, so to speak. And I think that is a great approach to hospitality and, yeah. and definitely with, uh, the Stillmans, it, that's what they did. Um, everyone at the Smith Alinsky Restaurant Group was there to watch, observe, make things better. And, and whether whether it was, you know, on the plate, how the plate looked, um, you know, was there too much stuff on the plate? Was the burger too high? Could you eat it with the hand? Did you eat it? Or whether it was, um, you know, how a display on the bar looked or, or what have you, every single detail was scrutinized. I love it, theater. In many ways. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And and the show changed every night. I love it. So talking about shows, I'd love for you to try a wine that I'm very, very excited about because it speaks a lot by one of your passion. But we'll talk about that in a second. I wanted to ask you, as this is a very secretive wine, you know, Mr. Patrick Egan, who runs our marketing, really restrained me. I wanted to name this wine something else. It was going to be called the Masochist. <laughs> Maybe it was a little extreme. <laughs> so he took me in a little room and he said, Jean Chau, you really know what the Masochist means? And I said, well, maybe not entirely. So he gave me a true English definition and I got scared for a moment and he said, maybe we call it restrained. So it's actually reverse psychology. So I really like this idea of him coming up with this great name for this Napa wine. But before we ask you to talk about it, what is the secret we should know about any restaurant that you've been involved with? Share with us something that we should know behind the scene that happens that makes it so special. Mm -hmm. I, think that, I think that it's the, the communication with the staff. When mm -hmm. the staff gets along, when the sommelier is friends with the chef, uh, when when there's good camaraderie, things click. It works, and and everyone feels it in every moment, and everyone is there to help everyone else. Because when that doesn't happen, and I've seen that not happen in restaurants, when I've I've been part of the team opening other restaurants, it really becomes a slog. It, it's a slog. It's a chore, and it shows up, I think, in the service. But when I everyone's see. in it together. It's amazing. It's, you know, it's the world series of, of being in hospitality. And, and how do you actually make this happen? Because it's not that easy to get, you know, people on stage to really be in sync and synergies and all on their game at the same time, as you said, it's like professional athletes, but how do you do that every night consistently? I, well, I think it's there's a, a little bit of that, um, you know, the je ne sais quoi, um, and there's just a little bit of people connecting, and that's luck, truly pure luck, um, because even at the best restaurants, the people can be super well trained and may not be that um, that enthusiastic to work together. Even if they perform, they may yeah. not do it um, with that level of ease and elegance and, and happiness, and we can all sense that generally from each other. Most of us can. Um, so, but I think you need a good head coach. I think you need a great GM or a great owner, um, or maybe a great chef, depending on how the restaurant is organized, but you need a leader um, yes. that you will do, you know, that you, uh, that you respect, that you trust, um, that you will follow um, and, and say, you know, I completely think this is absurd. I don't agree, but I'm going to do it because, you know, I believe in you and then, and then watch the magic happen. I love it. Or, of course, think, oh, that's an amazing idea. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> yeah, no, very well said. So on that note, you have a lot of great ideas on your wine list. And I know you're a big fan of the non-obvious great varieties. You search always for something that people may not know. Would you want to share that with us a little bit? Yes, I'm, I'm a huge fan of um, the, the unknown. Um, there's so much diversity in wine, and we... Um, have been so focused on you know, a few grape varieties. And that's great because in, even within a grape variety, there are lots of different styles of wine. 
um, from made from all over the world. But um, I, 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 you know, I wouldn't call them unicorn wines by any means, but just things that we're just less familiar with. Um, and so I, I've always been a champion of that. And I do a lot of work in um, in Europe, especially with um, Eastern European wines. Um, and you know, you you see all the they they're making Merlot and Cabernet and Syrah, and that's awesome. But then they have their own grape varieties. I'm like, hold the show. No one else has these. This is so cool. This is what you should be making. I mean, make the other stuff too. There needs to be something for everyone and winemakers are infinitely curious. So they need some room to play. But I really love finding um, unusual grape varieties um, and, and, and things that are just absolutely delicious wines to drink. You have a thirst to make people discover what they don't necessarily know, maybe, too. I do. I do. And I think that people um, are often, even in great restaurants with great wine lists, they're, they're cautious because wine can be expensive, even if it's a, a, a you know, kind of even a basic bottle. No one wants to waste money um, on something that they don't like. But there are so many fantastic wines out there. We all need a, you know, we all need to kind of extend a hand to someone else to, um, to say, no, no, no come on board with me. This is going to be a great experience. I'm so much with you. So I just realized, by the way, I had served myself resurrection and not yet restraints. So why don't you describe us restraints and tell us about how you feel? Because this is obviously a very special wine. And as you know, tonight, you're in your bedroom, which is very... You don't need to move far away. You could take it off and we designed it to make sure. And, you know, our vice president of marketing, Patrick, is very much into those activities in the bedroom. So he said, we got to <laughs> get something. He was not yet married at the time. And he said, you know, we got to get and make something for our guests that they can actually recycle in the bedroom as they drink the wine. And he served it to Michelle his wife to be, and this was when she said yes. So he yeah. really, from what <laughs> I love I heard, it. adorned her with leather on both sides of her arms, and her arms were up, and he asked a question, and she said, but of course, Patrick, I knew <laughs> it forever. <laughs> so I just want to show you. He showed me how to do it. I'm not really an expert as well as he is, of course. Hopefully, I think one you have to be a little coordinated you know, as well. The birth of the first child will know. Maybe <laughs> he'll, he'll dare to show us more pictures. <laughs> you know, we've been wanting to be in the bedroom with them because there's so much happening. But that's certainly one activity. <laughs> Isn't it cool? It's fantastic. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because I actually um, had unbuttoned the snaps earlier. Oh. But I was I was afraid to take it off because I didn't know what would happen. Um, and but it, um, I love it the, the, I like the it. paraphernalia. Kind of the neck, maybe I could see it because you're very petite and so well, you know, gorgeously <laughs> structured. God, wow, <laughs> this is very much Alexander McQueen meets Hermès. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's an amazing, uh, typically I put it around the arms or mm -hmm. the, as a sandal, they replicated the Roman style of fashion. And I'm sure you've seen it was seven, eight years ago. My sister got herself those amazing sandal that goes up like this all the way up to your knee. Mm -hmm. And they are twisted like, I love how you're wearing it. it. It works pretty well, actually, with the gray. Well, I, I dressed I'm appropriately. <laughs> We know you're audacious. You, you, we've never done it that way. It looks awesome. I'm gonna, I, take, I, I'm gonna freeze that picture and I'm gonna recommend we do a bigger one for the Magnums. Maybe, I don't know why Patrick was so short-sighted. I thought he would think big. Maybe a three liter, a six liter, a nine liter. So we could wrap our body around it. Yeah, absolutely. Because also it's good to have different, um, different sizes because this is, you know, for me, this is, is quite big to wrap around my yeah, arm. But sure. actually, maybe I could put it up here. Well, I've been doing do. a lot of push-ups. That works. Uh, you know, Christy, during this COVID time, my upper body is much more developed than it's ever been. So Good for you. Now, now I could fit it in my uh, lower arm. <laughs> See, it, it, it works here as well. Oh, I love it. <laughs> well, and this is very cool. So this is welcoming, as you know, 
the whole Ira of Great Variety. So I'd love to hear your master of wine description of this wine. Because I know you'll do a magical job. Well, thank you. And I just have to comment as well that once you once you take this off and you see this just restrained at the bottom, it's very dramatic. It's like, ooh, what's in there? What's being hidden? <laughs> <laughs> what's being restrained? How do I get that out? Uh, so what I really enjoyed, and especially contrast, you know, comparing and contrasting these two wines, was that um, they had very different personalities, and this one of the two is the more structured, and so possibly the more restrained. Um, you know, what um, since we were talking about texture and mouthfeel before, I'm just going to start with that. And what I noticed is that there are some kind of kind of grainier, grippy, grippier tannins in yes. this wine. Um, just a touch more drying in the in the best kind of way yes. and um, definitely more um, acidic presence and um, that it may not be technically more acid but I definitely felt more of kind of that mouth watering acidity in this wine and I was yep. like wow this is this is kind of buckled up if you will <laughs> yeah. and and um, I was like wow that is a great name for this wine because it's um, it, it definitely is is nicely structured and there's um, there's really good, I think, aging potential because it has that fantastic acidity and those nice tannins. So now, uh, Christy, I'm going to interrupt you for a second, just for a second, forgive me, as you're putting your nose. I would love in the second part of your description to go wild in terms of description that are not technical, that would allow all our listeners who are not into the wine world because you were very phenomenally technical. You were very master of wine. Go crazy. Okay. Go crazy. Unleash the leather. Huh? <laughs> exactly. Um, well, okay. So the, the thing that stands out to me the most when I smell the wine, um, that is, um, that it's kind of like, whoa, what's happening there? Is this very um, meaty, olivey, gamey sort of thing yeah. and um and i see that kind of i see the cabernet sauvignon with all of its kind of um uh black currant black plum darkness uh, yeah. and then right beside it something that's dark but kind of more feral and like this kind of like ooh la la um thing and and i think that i really see the syrah in there um, yeah. which is fascinating to me because it's it's not a ton um it's, you know not a lot of it but it's it, it's, it really does stand out to me. Um, and I, I love Syrah and Syrah is absolutely one of the great varieties that got me into wine. Between really? Syrah on the Northern Rhone and then of course Syrah with Grenache and, and other great varieties in the Southern Rhone. But that's where my, my first um, kind of heartthrob with wine was, was in, in the Rhone Valley in France. So I'm a big Syrah fan. Mm, um, so great to hear. To me, that stands out, um, along with something that seems quite um, violety, maybe yes. a little purple, maybe a little blueberry, and that to me is is very petite verdot. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, th so that's something that I, I, I think I see. And of course, there's so much going on. It's such a complex, concentrated wine that you know I I might be pulling out things that um, you know are actually well, we attributable will... to something else, but. You know, I got to tell you, we're going to imagine you in your bedroom suites where you are in Brooklyn and enjoying the wine all night. So we we excited about that. Just the vision of it, of your husband coming home. And here we go. My darling, I'm going to lay and I'm going to show you my leather. With my Ooh. armband. <laughs> <laughs> so before we go more into wine, tell us about Brooklyn and why your choice and what's happening in terms of food trends and and, and why Brooklyn is such an amazing place to, to visit, to be in, and, and to experience a restaurant scene as well. Yeah, Brooklyn is terrific. Um, I moved uh, to Dumbo, down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass. So I'm in between the Brooklyn and the Manhattan Bridges. It's, I wow. think it's New York City's smallest neighborhood. It's a tiny little piece of real estate. And um, we moved here four and a half years ago. Um, we, when we purchased our, our home, we both moved from Chelsea, where I had lived for 10 years, and I had lived all over Manhattan for, um, I guess, about, well, a long time before that. Let's not, let's not add up those years. <laughs> so, yeah, but that's exciting. So you've experienced different neighborhoods and different parts of New York, and you ended up here, which is a great choice. 
Yeah. And I, I love it because it is, um, it's this tiny little enclave. So we have the, the East River um, as kind of our front yard, if you will. Um, it's two blocks away. Um, massive big Brooklyn Bridge Park is there. Um, so that's really lovely. So you have that. Um, then we have all of downtown, which is kind of cut off from us by um, a massive park, Cadman Plaza. Then we have the Navy Yard. And then we have Brooklyn Heights. So we're really kind of tucked into our own little quiet place. Um, and it's, my husband calls it Brooklyn Light because uh, Dumbo was uh, once a, a manufacturing area. Uh, area. Um, sugar, coffee uh, was processed here in, in our great warehouses. So there are a lot of the big buildings around here. I was known as Gareville for um, the, Mr. Gare who founded uh, or who had many of the factories here. Um, oh. it's, it's very much, it feels like Soho. And, it, and we're closer to downtown Manhattan than to many of the trendy neighborhoods of Brooklyn, like Park Slope and um, Gowanus and, the, and those other places. So uh, what, something that is very different in Brooklyn with regard to the food scene versus Manhattan is that Manhattan has so many large restaurants. They have the small intimate ones in the West Village and East Village and, every, and other places as well. But it's really, um, Brooklyn tends to be a very small, intimate, casual, familiar dining scene, as opposed to something super ritzy and fancy. So you get, um, there's an emphasis on local, of course you get that in Manhattan too, but you really, you get this feeling like you're sitting in someone's home a lot of the time, or it's it's definitely more intimate, um, but definitely the, the, the local, um, and not just um, New York state, but even, you know, Long Island on the same island that Brooklyn sits on, it's all about, um, you know, uh, supporting the people truly, truly close to you and around you. I love and it. one of the one of the great things about so many of the chefs that we have here in Brooklyn is that they've they've cooked in the great restaurants in Manhattan, in multiple restaurants in Manhattan, or maybe in other great restaurants across the U.S. or in Paris or in other uh, food meccas around the world. And they come to New York because it's you know one of the food capitals, but Manhattan's expensive, and yeah. so they can come to Brooklyn. Exactly. which is trendy and they get they've got people who have you know who are interested in great food who um are who want imaginative food and, and exciting different food experiences um and the rent is cheaper they get a little more space and they get a fun excited um yeah, it's, it's a very different more homegrown crowd um sure. but homegrown being you know kind of local not that everyone is actually from the neighborhood originally well, I love it. So in terms of food, because wine naturally goes with food and vice versa, we need them both in a balanced diet. What is the coolest trend you've seen in the world of food that you want to be part of that you thought would never happen and it's finally going on? Because it's so happening where you are. It's the area of innovation in the country. One, one of the things that I love is just seeing so many interesting, innovative um, vegetarian dishes, just uh, just produce um, cool. and the amazing green markets that we've had in New York for a long time, but that are continuing to expand in New York State. Um, I love that um, I, I'm not a vegetarian, I eat everything, um, but um, I, I enjoy having amazing, great produce. And I think that people learning how to cook more for themselves and learning yes. how to use great produce as opposed to buying something that's frozen or, you know, processed and prepared and then throwing it into a microwave. I think that's exciting. And to have, to, to understand how important fruits and vegetables are for our bodies, for the earth, um, and, and to kind of move a little bit away um, from, from some of our protein uh, sources is, is exciting and important. And, and when someone comes to all the restaurants you deal with and say, I'm vegetarian, I'm gluten-free, I'm vegan, I'm following the Paleto diet, uh, do you succeed to recommend wines? How, what's your process of thinking when there's no meat or fish involved? When there's no meat and fish, it's, it's usually a, a play of, of tannin that I'm, I'm most concerned with. And it yeah. really kind of depends because you know, there are definitely um, uh, vegetables and mushrooms that do very well with tannin, but it kind of depends on what, what you have on the plate. So I'm, it's mostly tannin I'm concerned about. I welcome acidities of pretty much any level, um, 
but it's it's tannin that I'm paying attention to the most. Um, and oftentimes, you know, you want those wines um, with lighter dishes, those kind of more glue glue wines, you know, very drinkable, yeah. gulpable, easy going wines um, when you're looking at something that is uh, light. But there are plenty of vegetarian and vegan dishes that are that can be very hearty with that. Uh, with maybe um, squashes or root vegetables that can even be fried that can definitely take on heavier or heartier wine. So just like with anything else, um, when you're looking at a, a wine list and trying to make a customer happy, it's this, it's, it's a, it's kind of a, a you know, you've got a mix of fairy dust that you, yeah. <laughs> you're throwing into the air to work no, it out. You explained it very well. And I think using the tannin scale is, is a great one as well. Now, as I'm serving the next wine, I serve resurrection. You're a big fan, as we discussed earlier, about for some people more esoteric grape variety, although they've been very old and historical. And one of them, we use it in India and in France, of course, and in Bordeaux in the old days, is Marcelon that we are a big fan of. And in Ajenun, wine from India, this has been extremely popular to use Marcelon because it adds what you're going to say. How did you fall in love with that grape variety? Oh, you know, I think that I, I first tasted Marcelon in Bulgaria. Um, there are several wineries that use Marcelon. Um, I believe at Villa Milnik. Uh, there, there are several of them. And I remember just thinking, gosh, what is that? Well, we still have <laughs> a master wine. I never encountered it before. Well, Eastern Europe, South of France, still Bordeaux a little bit. And obviously India is a big is a big discovery there for the reasons you just explained, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and fascinatingly, Bordeaux AOC, Bordeaux Superior, just um, uh, uh, allowed uh, Marcelon to be admitted to its Cahiers de Char, so uh, Vigneron can plant Marcelon there. And yes, I've seen quite a few um, examples of Marcelon coming out of Southwest France, and there's yeah. some really nice Marcelon rosés. So I, I just think it's fascinating because every time I've tasted it, which is not a ton, but every time I taste it, I like it. So um, that obviously is not just the, you know, where it's being grown and, and you know, and who's making it. I think there's got to be something else because every time I taste it, I like it. Yes. Well, and China too uh, has a lot of plantings of Marcelon, but we'll have you try Genoon that we make in partnership in the matter hashtag prefecture you talked about vegetables and and beautiful flavors with vegetables it goes amazingly well so i was glad to discover that you love that great variety that many people don't know now we're talking about a resurrection tell us about what you feel when you taste this wine tell us what you sense what this wine brings into the charming christy herself well, when I, I, I'm going to taste it in just one second again, but when I first tasted this, um, I thought, you know, and, and the mind can be led in so many ways, but I thought, wow, you know, when I think of the idea of a resurrection and kind of that uplift and that, you know, resurrection seems, you know, joyous, it's happy, it's good, it's, it's, um, it's kind of an outpouring of, of positivity. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is plush, it's lush, it's this outpouring of, it just, you know, uh, of Napa gorgeousness, um, you know, everything that is um, that sunshine filled, friendly, beautiful, gorgeous valley. Um, and so that was my initial impression um, of resurrection. We're gonna encapsulate that just part of the video and use it all over the world now. We love it, well <laughs> said. Thank you. But what I, um, what I really like about this wine is that I think that I'm mostly getting this, um, it, there's this kind of like almost wild untamed vigor um, yeah. of Napa fruit in the best way that um, that's kind of like, bam. Mm. And then at the end, it, it cleans itself up and it's like, oh, wait, it's not just fruit. There's some tannin and there's the acid. And it's like, oh, and then it makes me want to go back for another sip. And I will. <laughs> well, we love it. Untamed vigor. So, Christy, you do so many great things besides restaurant, besides television, besides private seminars that people can obviously call you to, to conduct. 
uh, consulting and all that. What is the most rewarding you do and, and why? What is the most what? Sorry. Re rewarding, the most fulfilling, the most exciting, the, the things you love the most to do, really. Um, I guess there are two things. One is that I love being with winemakers where they're making wine. Yes. And so when I, on, in a normal non-COVID affected year, I'm traveling probably 30 to 40% of the time. Wow. And being with, yeah, it's a lot, but I, I, I love it. Um, my dog less. <laughs> it's I a it. four legs. So what kind of dog is it? Uh, he's a terrier of mix. So a um, bit of a, a Norwich terrier. Um, and um, he has an awful lot of personality. He lets me know that he doesn't like my suitcases, as do all dogs. <laughs> I love that. But I, I love being with people. In, in, I live in New York. Almost everyone comes through New York at some, at some point in time or frequently. So I get to see a lot of people here, which is great. Yes. But being with them in their vineyards, in their winery, in their restaurants, it's, it's like speaking another language. You know, you, you understand the color that, that comes behind the person and the wine to make it what it is. And I really like that. So that's one of the, the most amazing things um, when I'm, I'm out in the wine world. And then the other thing is um, I love talking to people about wine, um, especially consumers, uh, because they it's immediate feedback. And I love writing about wine, but your text goes off into the, you know, into print in a magazine or onto the web. Yeah, but you're an you amazing writer. People make, keep your articles. Well, that's that's kind, maybe. <laughs> Hopefully, oh, sure Hopefully the do. good ones, the really good ones. <laughs> but when you when people when you see people reacting and they get excited and you see their eyes light up, that's just I mean immediate satisfaction. And who doesn't crave at least a little bit of that right now? <laughs> that's very true. And, and what about television? I mean, you're so good on screens. You've done a lot of things for all varieties of channels. Which, which one do you like the most? And, and what was the most fun memory? Well, um, oh gosh, you know, it's, it's, it's been fun to talk about lots of different uh, kinds of wines and different venues that um, I, I gotta say, I find that when I speak on news channels, um, you know, it's kind of buttoned up and you're, you're speaking quickly and an anchor is kind of leading you to certain points and that's it. Um, one of the most fun times I've ever had talking and filming wine um, was with my friend Andres Larsson from Sweden um, when we were filming with uh, Wine Masters TV um, in yeah. the Netherlands, which was super fun and we're teaching people doing ridiculous experiments wearing like lab coats, I could have fit three of me in my my lab coat when we did these experiments and we're wearing goggles. I mean, it's seriously yeah. unphotogenic, but it was fun. And it, and that's what wine should be, um, you know, and, and we can be serious about it too, but it was, that was just an awful lot of fun. And that's what I love about you is in spite of your phenomenal background, your great success, your masters of wine and, and all the great things you do, you don't always take yourself seriously. And that's very important. As you said, it's, it's a happy beverage, a beverage of culture, civilization, art, culture, but we got to have fun with it too. There's no reason to be too stiff about it. Absolutely. And you are the king of well, doing that. You, you can't, it's impossible to watch a video of you doing anything with regard to wine without laughing. Oh, there's actually. always a smile. There's always, you know, like, not just like a, a, it's not a smile. It's not a chuckle. It's like a full from the belly kind of laugh. Thank you. <laughs> like, like, well, what, what is he doing? It's amazing. <laughs> you know, it's, it's um, as, as you do with food and wine and all what you do, using wine as the catalyst of discussion, conversation, bring people together and having an amazing time. So on that note, we've had an amazing time together. This is the time for the ultimate statement the wiseness or the craziness from the famous Christy Canterbury. Give us, you know, to all our listeners from all around the world, because we have a lot in Asia, a lot in Europe, as you know, your French friends are listening and with us tonight. Uh, what would be in 2021, people aspiring to be you, to have done from finance to a great life in the food, beverage, hospitality, wine world, to become the master of wine, to become such the charismatic lady in the world of wine. So give us maybe a, a wise message or unwise 
or full of leather of what's going to happen. <laughs> daring. Ooh, I, it, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I think it's good to be daring. And, and that's, I think, a, a really important message is that um, usually in life, there's more than one way to do things. Yes. And um, you, jean are an excellent example of that because you do things different. You know, you, in Napa Valley, you give a very fresh perspective, very different from so oh, many others there. But there's there's more always more than one way and yes you know you may have to pass a test or you may have to do this and that but to get to that milestone there's probably more than one way so if you don't like the way you're being told to do it try to find another way or try to find someone to help you do it the way that it's got to be done because there's always a way I that's what i've got well christy and this is maybe the little bit of the seeds of the texan in you there's always a way <laughs> And I love it. I'm scrappy. You combine, <laughs> well, you combine the best, you know, Texas, who is claiming its independence, who knows if they will get it, to the East Coast, to Europe, uh, you know, as an MW, a writer, a TV personality, a buyer, a restaurant, phenomenal leader. You've done it all. And this was so much fun, Christy, to be together. I cannot wait. We haven't seen each other in three years now. It has been way too long in person, yes. at least. We want to thank you really from all our hearts for all of us making wine to have such an amazing person to be the ambassador of wine. Because you know it, but it's always great to hear it again. You are this amazing, eloquent, elegant, and phenomenal persona that brings wine to all the consumers you talked about, and we thank you for it. So to you, yes? Oh, I was just going to say thank you for the opportunity to, to be on your amazing happy hour. And congratulations uh, to you. You're so prolific. You've done, you've, you've united so many people and introduced us all to so many different great wine personalities. Thank you. Um, thank you. And, I'm, and it's I'm only the beginning, here. as you said, you know, everybody belongs to wine, so wine belongs to everyone. And I think that's a very important statement that we should all keep to our mind. You know, let's make wine on everybody's table at every time, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and after hour, not just happy hour. And send us pictures. You'll receive a case of wine, and we want to see you in the <laughs> bathtub as well. This in the bath, and this in the, the bubbly bubble bath. <laughs> Do you promise? I, I promise. Dear friends, you will be indulging the beautiful Christy herself in the bathtub with the leather, and we'll make sure Patrick appears in some way, shape, or form as the author of this one. So I thank you it. so much. A great time. Phenomenal 2021. And thank you for being with us. Thank you. Merci. À bientôt. Kisses. À bientôt. <laughs>